Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege you've given us of knowing Jesus. And this morning we're going to study a little bit more about the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just want to confess right up front that this is something that is totally beyond our understanding, that we could not have any idea of it except what you revealed to us. And what you have revealed, we're thankful for, but we also recognize it's very, very small compared to the totality of who you are. And we look forward to the, to the years of eternity when we will get a much bigger picture of the things that we're talking about today. I ask your blessing on each one here. You know all the things going on in the back of our minds, our, our family's needs, our financial needs, uh, all kinds of, of concerns. And we just want to lay those on you for right now and ask you to help us to concentrate on this matter of the Godhead and how we may visualize it recognizing that none of us knows it perfectly. In fact, none of us knows it really at all, but we have some ways of talking about it that we hope make it a little more real to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so we're using this word Trinity, which is uh, verboten in some circles. But um, I think I'm going, to, I'm going to try anyway to show you by the end of tomorrow's presentation that there are good reasons for using this term, even though there are some things associated with it that, uh, that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. But uh, there are things associated with all sorts of aspects of Christianity that uh, we don't necessarily agree with. And... Uh, we, we still use the terms, even though we don't mean exactly, maybe, what somebody else means by it. So, we're looking at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Seeking an Adventist understanding of the Godhead. And we're also going to look at Ellen White's role in its development. A key text is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Notice that all we know for sure about God is what he's chosen to reveal to us. There's nothing we can find out about God against his will or without his help. The purpose of his revelation is that we may enter into a personal relationship with him. We may know him, be transformed into his image, and do his will. Learning objectives for this lecture are that we may know some of the strongest biblical evidences for the Trinity. We may understand why early Adventists doubted the doctrine of the Trinity. At least some of them did, not all. We can recognize historical stages in the acceptance of the Trinity among Adventists, understand Ellen White's role in this doctrinal change, and differentiate Ellen White's biblical concept of the Trinity from the traditional Roman Catholic and Protestant doctrine. And want to remind us right at the beginning that just as we look into the starry heavens and the more powerful telescopes we can build, the more we find that we never knew before. And God is the maker of the universe. That means he's bigger than the universe. He's greater than the universe. And as little as we can understand the wonders of the universe, how much more are we unable to grasp the full extent of the wonder of our God? And, and so we acknowledge at the very beginning that uh, we are just peering into a little tiny bit 
of what is there and we look forward to spending eternity exploring much more fully. An Adventist view of God. Um, a brief look at our historical development shows that Ellen White played an influential role in helping us accept a biblical view of God without the constraints of unbiblical philosophical presuppositions. Now that's a major uh, concept that we're going to uh, refer to again and that is that early in Christianity, um, due to the persecution of the Jews by the Romans, the early Christians wanted to make sure there was a good, strong boundary between them and the Jews. And so when the Emperor Hadrian, approximately 135, passed a set of laws outlawing um, the teaching of the Torah, outlawing the keeping of the Sabbath, prohibiting Jews from living in Jerusalem, and placing a tax on every living Jew just because he was a Jew. There was a tax on a Jew just because you were a Jew. And this level of oppression and persecution, um, the Christians said, look, we don't want any part of this, so let's make sure that everybody knows that we're not Jews. And in the wake of that uh, comes the the movement away from the Sabbath towards Sunday, and also the downgrading of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament becomes viewed as sort of a, a sort of a secondary source in Scripture, and the New Testament is exalted as the Christian's Bible. And as a result, there was a need for a foundation for the New Testament because the New Testament talks about God and the world and creation and human nature and all kinds of things which are defined in the Old Testament. But if you're not reading the Old Testament anymore, then uh, you lose sight of what the Old Testament viewed as the definitions of these things. And, and the, the natural thing that filled the gap was the, the um, uh, Greek philosophy. And the Greek philosophers had a view of God as absolute perfection. And if, if God is absolutely perfect, then he can't change. Because if he changed, he'd get either better or worse. And he can't get better because he's already perfect. And he can't get worse or he'd no longer be perfect. So therefore, God cannot change. And they went so far as to say that God cannot even be affected by things outside of himself. So God cannot even think about sinful human beings, his perfection would be tainted if he, if he were to think about us. And so all this runs contrary to what Scripture says, that God has a, a heart of love and that Jesus enters into our sorrows and bears our, our iniquities. And, and so this, this philosophical view of, of God, uh, one historian said that the, the concept of God in Greek philosophy was more like a cosmic divine emperor than a loving father. And so all of this comes in, and of course the, the most obvious part is the belief in the immortality of the soul, which lays the foundation for eternal uh, burning hell, uh, purgatory, limbo, the intercession of saints, the communication with evil spirits, and all kinds of things and we won't go into that now. But what we're trying to do and what the early Adventists tried to do was separate the biblical concepts from the traditional things that have gathered around the biblical concepts. Now here's a resource that some of you, probably most of you are familiar with. It's been out for several years now. But uh, this is the book, The Trinity, Understanding God's Love, His Plan of Salvation and Christian Relationships. And I think it's still in print. Um, last I knew, it was, it was discounted at the, at the Adventist Book Center, uh, down to maybe 4 or $5 instead of the 20 that it was to start with. And, uh, but this is still, um, I, I believe I'm not boasting since I had a part in it, I think it's still the, the best single book on the Trinity that is published by the Adventist Church and uh, looking at it from an Adventist point of view. And I'll just briefly review some of the concepts of it. 
or some of the sections. Uh, it begins with biblical foundations. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 tells us that God is one. And Genesis 1, 26 and 27 speaks of God as we and us and our. The one God exists in a plurality of persons. Uh, New Testament references to that also. Now we believe both statements. We believe that God is one. We believe that God is three. And we believe it because the Bible says so. Now, understanding it, explaining it is another question. And so that is what has led to all kinds of attempts to illustrate it, some of which have been helpful and positive, and some of which were ultimately not very helpful. And uh, during the Middle Ages, the, uh, the theologians and the philosophers of the medieval church tried to illustrate what they understood by the Trinity in the concepts of the, uh, the philosophy, which was included what we would call science of that time. And so, but some of those things look pretty fanciful today and even unbiblical. So um, we have our own illustrations, which, which have their shortcomings also. So the first part of the book is is called the strongest biblical evidence for the Trinity. And uh, I'm going to briefly review it here. Uh, Woodrow Whitten was the author of this section. And it deals with the full eternal deity of Christ, the personhood and the full deity of the Holy Spirit, and then the unity in nature and character of the three persons of the Godhead. So looking at some of this biblical evidence, um, the definition of divine nature or deity. All Bible-believing Bible Christians, whether Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian, seem to agree that the Bible describes the Creator God as having at least seven distinct divine attributes. He's personal, but everywhere present. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. He lives from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal. He's unchanging in nature and character. He's all righteous and good, and he's a being of perfect selfless love. And that we all agree on. The Old Testament uses many names and titles to refer to God, including El, Elohim, Adonai, especially Yahweh. All of those refer to the true God. The New Testament sometimes indicates that certain Old Testament passages have either the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit specifically in view. And some non-Trinitarians think that the term Lord applies only to God the Father. Others think Lord refers only to God the Son. But reading the Old Testament from the perspective of the New Testament shows that the term Lord can refer to any one of the members of the Godhead or to all three in their profound oneness. Now the key question that confronted the early church was, could they retain their strong view of God's oneness inherited from Judaism and yet affirm the full eternal deity of Jesus Christ? And of course, that was the big stumbling block for many of the Jewish leaders because they said, we believe in one God. And if there's only one God, then this man from Nazareth can't be him. But the early church eventually came to see and to accept that Jesus was indeed himself God, even though manifest in the flesh. And here's one passage, Hebrews 1, actually the whole chapter of Hebrews 1 is on the deity of Jesus Christ. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time fast to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become so much better than the angels, 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You're my son, I've begotten you? And again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. The clear conclusion is that Jesus is God, since only God can rightly be worshipped. It goes on to say that he makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The quotation is clearly talking about God and, and the expression, O God, is in the vocative case, the grammatical case of direct address. Clearly, the Bible writers are applying the term God to Jesus Christ. God the Father says to God the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. There's a quotation from Psalm 102. And again it says, You, Lord. Lord is the name given in the Old Testament to the great I Am, Yahweh or Jehovah. The author of Hebrews is taking an Old Testament prayer to the Lord, creator of the universe, and applying it to none other than Jesus Christ. Another one is quoted from Isaiah 44, 6. Uh, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And Revelation chapter 1 and other verses echo these quotations from Isaiah, applying the same terms to Jesus himself. In John 8, 58, Jesus applied the name of Yahweh in Exodus 3, 14 to himself. The response of attempted stoning shows that his hearers clearly understood him as claiming to be the God of the Old Testament. The Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Uh, might make a note here. Um, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, but uh, I have given the PowerPoint and several handout materials to the Secretary in Church History, and she's going to post them on your um, website. So uh, you, you all, all have access to this. So you can relax a little bit and, and think about what we're talking about, not feel like you have to get it all down. Okay, the second concept that we're looking at is the personhood and the deity of the Holy Spirit. Acts 5, 1 to 4, familiar story. A certain man named Ananias sold a possession kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? In other words, you didn't have to give it. It was a free will offering. You could have kept it. And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The clear implication is that the Holy Spirit is God. It says, you lie to the Holy Spirit, you have not lied to men, but to God. Ephesians 4.30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Can we grieve an it or a thing? To grieve means to cause grief, sorrow, disappointment, feelings that only personal beings can experience. Strong evidence for the personhood and the deity of the Holy Spirit. And then the triunity of the one God. Now that's the actual meaning of Trinity. It's, it's like the word trio. 
you have one trio of three voices. Um, triunity shortened to Trinity. It means three in one. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One name, but three persons. They're one in character and nature, but with individual personalities. 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And uh, this is familiar. Uh, many places in the New Testament we have similar, similar expressions. Matthew 3, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So as Jesus begins his mission of redemption at his baptism, all three members of the heavenly trio are present, united yet distinct. Now we turn to some Old Testament evidence. Deuteronomy 6.4, the famous Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. The Hebrew word echad is used some 1,000 times in the Old Testament to mean unique or one. In a few places, echad refers to one unique thing composed of plural parts. Is that the sense in which it is used here? I think so, but you can't prove it from linguistics alone. Uh, here are some other passages that use Echad. Genesis 2.24 Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one Echad, one flesh. Here Echad refers to husband and wife, forming one unique family unit, separate from their parents. But while they are one flesh, they still remain two persons. Numbers 13.23 uh, when the spies came back from, from Canaan, they carried one echad, cluster of grapes, between two of them on a pole. Here again, echad donates something unique, one of a kind. They had never seen such a cluster of grapes. So heavy it had to be carried on a pole between two men. But even though it was one cluster, it was made up of many grapes. And so we have some hints of a plurality of personalities in the one true God. Genesis 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, that's the word of God, let there be light. So, so God the Father and the Word and the Spirit are all united in creation. A little later in the same chapter, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So he made one human nature, but in a plurality of forms. Uh, male and female. And then as we go to the New Testament, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, we already read, um, where we are baptized in the one name of the three divine persons. And so we come back to this basic uh, definition again. The basic biblical uh, parameters or, or a definition of the Trinity. There is one God. And the one God exists in three personalities. But how can this be? How can one plus one plus one equal one? And that's the conundrum that has had uh, some people stumbling for centuries. Um, a simple way of addressing this is to say that oneness in being that is, to be one being, for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be one being, that's, being has to do with ontology. It, it means oneness of being, ontological oneness. We believe that to be an essential attribute of God. 
But it's beyond our ability to verify, except by faith in divine revelation. None of us has seen God. None of us knows about the relationship in the inner being of God. There's another kind of oneness that we can much better comprehend, and that's oneness in relationship, where one man and a one woman and marriage makes one family. And this is the, the oneness in relationship is the kind of oneness that Ellen White picks up to compare the oneness between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here she quotes from, uh, well, this is, this is John 17. I guess the quote comes a bit later. John 17, 20 to 22, Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for all those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that they may be one just as we are one. So, so the, the unity between the Father and the Son is taken as an example of the unity between believers. Now, the unity between believers is a fairly poor reflection of the unity between the Father and the Son. And yet, when a church like the Seventh-day Adventist Church with perhaps the most diverse membership of any church in the world, when we actually do manifest our unity, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And it testifies that God is here because it's not human for us to be intimately united and faithful and loyal to people that are very different from us in many ways. Now we're going to look at the Trinity in Adventist history. And we're going to look at four periods of development. The first period is, uh, I've titled, Non-Trinitarians Dominant, approximately 1846 to 1876. Um, <clears throat> in 1846, James White made a statement that uh, we don't believe in the Trinity. And, um, and it was about 30 years later that they begin to reconsider this. Uh, some doubts begin to ari arise about anti-Trinitarianism. And um, from about 1877 to 18, uh, that says 1888, that actually should be 1898. Uh, and then there was a paradigm shift where they basically left behind the old non-Trinitarian view and accepted a Trinitarian view, but based on the biblical evidence, not accepting some of the traditions about it. And so the Trinity was accepted by Seventh-day Adventists in the Review and Herald in 1913. The editor wrote an editorial endorsing the Trinity. Um, the fundamental beliefs were first published in a church manual in 1931. And then in 1946, the fundamental beliefs were made official in general conference session. So really that 1946 is the landmark just 100 years after James White said, we don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, the general conference voted that yes, we do officially believe in the Trinity. And these fundamental beliefs cannot be changed except by a general conference session. And uh, we have changed them since then. Uh, in 1980, they were revised. And I believe it was about 2005 that uh, we added one more um, because we saw that there were things in the world that n there were needs in the world church that needed to be met by making clear what we believed about uh, our life in Christ. So let's look at this first, this first uh, section. We'll, we'll try to move as quickly as we can. During this early period, many Adventists, although not all, rejected the concept of the Trinity, at least as they understood it. And many of our pioneers were in this group. One noted Trinitarian was Elder Ambrose C. Spicer, who was the father of the later General Conference President, W.A. Spicer. 
And he had been a Seventh-day Baptist and remained Trinitarian as he became Adventist. But those who rejected the Trinity, here's, here's about five or six reasons why. Number one, some thought the Trinity made the Father and the Son identical, one and the same person. Is that true? We don't believe that, do we? When Jesus spoke to the Father, when Jesus was here on earth as a man and he spoke to the Father in heaven, he wasn't talking to himself. He was communicating, genuine communication with another. Uh, Joseph Bates said, respecting the Trinity, I concluded it was impossible for me to believe the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty God, the Father, one and the same being. Well, that's not what we believe today. I mean, what, what Joseph Bates condemned is not what we believe. He condemned a misunderstanding of the Trinity. I mean, he, he actually did not understand what the Trinitarians meant when they said that the Lord Jesus was one with the Father. And so he rejected it because he didn't understand. Some thought the doctrine of the Trinity taught the existence of three gods. Jan Loughborough said if the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are each God, it would be three gods. <laughs> and uh, that would, that is a heresy which the church has been strongly opposed to uh, down through the centuries. And we are also, we do not believe in three gods. Some thought the doctrine of the Trinity would diminish the value of the atonement. J.H. Wagner, in 1884, reasoned that since the ever-living, self-existent God cannot die, and that's true, then if Christ had possessed self-existence as God, he couldn't have really died on the cross. And therefore, our, our atonement would not be made in the way that the Bible says it was made. Well, Wagner was right that God cannot die. But he was wrong in saying that therefore Jesus didn't really die um, if, if he is God. Ellen White was unequivocal, not at that moment, but years later. She said, deity did not die, humanity died. But now, that is the morning of the resurrection, Christ proclaims over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, I am the resurrection and the life. This language can be used only by the deity. And 17 years later, she wrote, it was his human nature that died. Deity did not sink and die. That would have been impossible. And so there is an area where uh, Ellen White said, sorry, Elder Wagner, you're just wrong. Number four, some of the expressions referring to the Holy Spirit, such as pour out, shed forth, uh, the neuter pronoun it were thought to indicate the Holy Spirit couldn't properly be considered a person. Although in John 14 through 17, Jesus himself repeatedly refers to the Holy Spirit using the personal pronoun he. And then the fifth reason for rejection was the text that called God the only begotten of the Father and the beginning of the creation of God. So that they were thought, that was thought to show that Jesus could not be eternally pre-existent with the Father. Now this was the first aspect of the anti-Trinitarian position to be clearly rejected by both Ellen and James White. And I'll give you some references here. And summary, none of the above arguments is a valid objection to the basic concept of one God and three persons. They're all based on misunderstandings of the Trinity. These arguments made sense when they were more or less agreed on an anti-Trinitarian paradigm. But when they begin to have doubts about that paradigm, then they realize that all these points were capable of fitting either interpretation. You could take it differently and still be in harmony with scripture. The first signs of problems with the anti-Trinitarian view. Uh, in 1869, Ellen White published a major article on the sufferings of Christ. It's now volume, uh, Testimonies, Volume 2, page 200. And this was her first published denial of important aspects of the anti-Trinitarian view. In the opening paragraph, she said on the basis of three scriptures that Christ in his pre-existence was equal with God. In her last paragraph, she said Christ had pre-existed pre eternally. And there's the, uh, the actual quotation. A year later, 
James White's view begins to change, evidently following his wife's lead. In an 1876 editorial in the Review, comparing the beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists with Seventh-day Baptists, he mentioned the Trinity among the doctrines which neither Adventists nor Baptists regards of tests, as tests of Christian character, that is, membership. Adventists hold the divinity of Christ so nearly with the Trinitarian that we apprehend no trial, no conflict here. So James White, in 30 years, has come quite a ways from his repudiation of the Trinity doctrine in 1846. In 1877, he wrote in the review that Christ is equal with God, rejecting the view that Christ was inferior. He still did not agree, or he didn't know whether he agreed, with a Trinitarian view of three in one and one in three. But he said the ultra-Unitarianism that makes Christ inferior to the Father is worse. So he's, he's beginning to back off, which is something for a man as strong-willed as James White. He didn't back down easily. So then we see doubts arising about anti-Trinitarianism. And here's one, one evidence that uh, your professor in this class, uh, Dr. Kaiser, discovered in the uh, Center for Adventist Research uh, three or four years ago. There's a letter from Wagner to James White in 1879. And the next couple pages show the actual letter uh, with, the, with a date, Dear Brother White, um, yours from Minnesota was thankfully received. Um, in the next page he said, I have, thought, I have thought considerable about the matter you wrote of, though I've been too busy to apply my mind to it. But there's one query which will arise in my mind. It is on the question of the personality of the Holy Spirit. The more I think of it, the more I'm inclined to believe that the generally received view is correct. That would be the Trinitarian view. Uh, I will not stop to criticize the language of the New Testament. We know that the word spirit in Greek is in the neuter gender and in Hebrew, feminine. The Hebrew has no neuter gender, but it's generally conceded that the uh, authorized version, that's King James, is correct in using masculine pronouns when referring to the Holy Spirit in John 14. Okay, so we have a, a transcription here. So when you get the PowerPoint, you, can, uh, you don't have to necessarily get out your magnifying glass and try to reconstruct the, uh, the handwriting. He goes on to say, we, referring to Adventists in 1879, ordinarily use it instead of he. And then he says, perhaps it's allowable. But to it are ascribed attributes of personality as power, intelligence, emotions. It instructs, guides, moves to speak or do, is grieved, etc. But most of all, we're baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit. In the rite of baptism, the name of the Holy Spirit is placed with those of the Father and the Son. And to the Holy Spirit is given such prominence in creation, in redemption, in everything. As much as I've studied on this subject, and you know that for years my study in the Spirit has not been small, I am not prepared to take a positive position. Now here's Wagner, and he is being deferential to James White, because... Uh, but he's saying, James, you ought to be thinking about this. Uh, I am yet a student or an inquirer ready to be convinced by sufficient reasons. But I can appreciate this, that to remove the spirit from that position assigned to it in the scriptures would be no small error. Perhaps in the light of Matthew 12, 22 to 37, that's the passage on the unpardonable sin, no greater error could be committed. It is this which has for years prevented my speaking with positiveness on the subject. Says, I don't want to make any mistakes here, so I just keep my mouth shut. But if the Spirit is a personality and is third in position and power with the Father and the Son, then it would be an offense against the Spirit not to give him that position. The Great General Conference of 1888 increased the doubts because the emphasis on righteousness by faith and the exaltation of the cross of Christ called into question whether a subordinate derived divinity of Christ could adequately account for the saving power of Christ. And here we have E.J. Wagner, the son of J.H. Wagner, um, 
taking the lead. Uh, as his father is, uh, well, actually his father is dead by 1888. He died in 1886 or 7, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, anyway, his studies on righteousness by faith led E.J. Wagner to see that the basis of Christ's power to redeem is his eternal equality with God the Father. When he said to the thief on the cross, you will be with me in paradise, he could say that because he was God. Wagner urged the necessity to set forth Christ's rightful position of equality with the Father in order that his power to redeem may be better appreciated. He declared that Christ has life in himself. He possesses immortality in his own right. And that was before Ellen White wrote it in Desire of Ages. In 1890, when Wagner wrote Christ and His Righteousness, he was not yet fully Trinitarian in every detail of his views, but he saw clearly that a more exalted conception of Christ's work of redemption demanded a higher conception of His being as deity. The publication of Ellen White's Desire of Ages in 1898 set the stage for a gradual paradigm shift in the Adventist doctrine of the Godhead. On the first page of the first chapter, she wrote, from the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. In the chapter on the raising of Lazarus, in which Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, Ellen White commented, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. In other words, he didn't get it from anybody. He didn't, it wasn't original with God the Father and then delegated or passed on to Jesus. In him is life original, unborrowed, underived. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Now that is huge. That is huge. <sighs> Tempted to throw in a little bit of polemic here that um, in discussions with non-Trinitarians, It might be interesting to ask them if they have assurance of eternal life. Uh, if you don't believe that Jesus is eternal, then how do you know for sure? But there's one thing wrong about that, and here I need to stick to my notes. <laughs> um, it is important, and especially with this topic, because it's so controversial and it's so beyond our comprehension. It's important that we always be humble and loving and respectful of those who have different views. Because the Trinity view is not a perfect view. It is a, it is a feeble human attempt to try to grapple with what is revealed to us in Scripture. And there are other views that have things in their favor. And I don't believe anybody is going to be saved or not saved depending on how well they can describe the Trinity. Praise God for that. But she makes the point here that if Christ is not divine, we have no assurance of eternal life. And um, that's maybe a, a good place to stop. <laughs>